<coughs> cool. All right, just because it's the three of us, this this part will probably be pretty fast. Hey, come in. The four of us. Uh, this part will probably be pretty fast. Um, what we're going to go through is basically uh, what you guys need to do for assignment three. So the big assignment and how it relates to the first assignment. So, um, you know, almost finished marking all of the assignments for assignment one. Everyone did pretty well. It was generally quite good. Um, and how you should basically build from there to the next one and what the differences are. Um, I'll go through what an investor memo or memorandum is. Those terms are interchangeable. Sometimes in the literature it's referred to as just as an IM. It's all the same. I'll go through what that is and I'll go through examples of how I've used those techniques and give you the examples of ones I've raised money on before. Uh, and then just point to some resources. Do you guys have any questions before I kick off about last week or anything? No? Cool. All right, so assignment three, it's the big one, it's worth 50%, and it is the M an MVP and also an investor memo. So the word count or the, the word limit for this is 4,000 words. Uh, and one of the questions I got from a student earlier in the semester was, um, all right, does the MVP word count count for that 4,000 words? Now, in this assignment, basically it doesn't. The report has a has about 4,000 4, word limit and then whatever you do for your MVP. Just, so just try and be clear about that because word counts don't really work in the context like if your startup is a and you know a podcasting startup or like a video whatever like it's sort of it's sort of irrelevant the traction you're trying to build on your startup however you do it whatever content you create is is sort of um, distinct from the investor memo and how you how you assess that startup and try and pitch for money so it's just, this is an exercise in going through that hey come in um, we're just getting started So essentially, you got your MVP. The investor memo is basically just a report. So it's nothing more complicated than that. Um, but its intent is to communicate the business idea, the traction that you've received, uh, and all of the essential information around that. Essentially, it's usually what you would do if you're pitching to an investor or someone, could be an employee, could be an investor, could be an organization or something about your startup. You'll do a pitch, you'll do a presentation, and then at the end of it, you'll say, hey, can I just leave you some information? Generally, the investor memo is what you'd leave behind. If you're actually raising money on a startup, like there's some other stuff you'd need to do. I'm not sure about the um, legalities in other, other countries, but in Australia, if you're raising money from an, an investor, you have to, there's some legal stuff you have to do as well. Like you have to um, uh, declare that what you're handing over is basically I'm not gonna I'm not gonna step into legal territory and give you legal advice but you have to declare that it's true and you also have to get them to sign like a I'm a sophisticated investor kind of declaration as well uh, so it's pretty standard I think there's similar things in the US um, unless you're raising money off your friends and your family in which case you don't need to get that um, but we've had to get that every time we've raised money in the examples I'll show you of investor memos I've used there's lots of financial modeling and that sort of stuff you guys don't have to do that unless you really want to, but it's a lot more work. So I'd say for this exercise, just leave that out. Um, it needs to be of a standard that you would be willing to give to an investor. So just like imagine that you, this isn't an, like a university class. It needs to be of a high quality enough that you'd be willing to give it to someone who wasn't a university lecturer or a, you know, part of a course and say here's a business that I'm building and this is why it's amazing and this is why you should invest in it. Um, so if you wouldn't present, present it to say your boss or someone else then don't present it to me, don't give it to me. Um, it should cover all aspects of your business model. Just on the business model so you don't have to include the business model canvas for this. Um, I'll give you a structure that you can follow and you can deviate from it if you want. 
if you really want to, you can include it if you find it helpful. But that was sort of the business model canvas was a tool for more for assignment one. Um, whereas there's some other structure structural things you can follow, like a report structure, if you if you want uh, yeah. for this assignment. Uh, yeah, and one of the one of my key marking criteria for this assignment is progress and traction from assignment one. So unless you you say, all right, I've pivoted away from that idea. In the, you know, unless you communicate that to me and say, I pivoted away from this idea for this reason and now we've got this idea and it's even better. Uh, if you're saying, all right, my initial idea was a uh, slow living magazine, which is um, one of the students, uh, say that was assignment one, the next version will be the magazine plus the website potentially. And then, or it'll be the magazine, but then I've had this conversation with an advertiser and you know, here's some mock-ups of their ads for the for the MVP, or here's more content for other areas of the MVP. So I need to see that you've taken it from what it was in the first assignment and sort of built on it and developed it and and pushed the idea further. Some of the best uh, marks that, that I've given in for this assignment are when people get paid paying customers. That's like if you want to get a HD get some paying customers or an audience of some description. So if you can, that's the kind of traction that will make you stand out from generally everyone else. Because generally people go, yeah, I've got this great business idea in the assignment one. And they're like, yeah, and no, I've done a few more interviews and then like, it's just, you know, I'm getting it going a bit more and maybe here's another draft piece of content or here's the website, but it's not quite finished. If you, you know, get your get your content out there. You build an audience, and then you try and sell some advertising. That's like, that's really really good in the context of this assignment. And then if you work your way backwards from there, if you imagine like the marking criteria, as I said at the start, traction is everything. So that's not necessarily relevant for every business idea. Some business ideas have a different model. Some sometimes it might not be possible to get that kind of sale without that kind of period. If you're a media startup, then you should at least be able to try and build some sort of audience between now and when it's due. Um, the MVP needs to be more of a reflection of the business you describe in the investor memo. So it can't just be like a blog with uh, some dummy content in there. It has to be real content, for example. Are there any questions on that? So I've already covered that first point there. The second point is um, pretty pertinent. If I could see any next steps in your business model canvas and say, all right, uh, from assignment one, the next things to do are X, X, and X, then I would like to see some progress on those things. Or if you said, all right, well, I've proved these or proved or disproven these hypotheses around my value proposition in assignment one, but my hypotheses around the channel like channel to market, for example, um, then I'd like to see you try and prove some of those hypotheses. If you're looking for areas to work on, ultimately, if you build up, if you've built out the full idea, you should be testing all of those areas of the of the business model canvas in that context. Um, but if you said, all right, these are the ten things that I would do next in your report, or if I could see that you reference, say, all right, the next thing to do is X, Y, Z, then I'd like to see you have done some of those things at least. Am I just turn this light down? Cool. All right, I'll get into the investor memo. So, what they are? If you there's a, a great article just there around investor memorandums or information memoram, memorandums, specifically for Austra the Australian market. In America, they call them investor memos, and they're generally shorter. Um, they are pretty short reports, so 20 to 30 pages is probably what you guys would be aiming for on that on that um, word limit. Uh, what you guys submit, the full IM, is generally probably not what you're going to be sending to an, in, an investor on the first time that you ever meet them. So some of the things that I'll show you after here are probably like, you know, the next level up from like the full investor memo report where you've got everything about the business, which is what you guys need to do. There are examples where it might just be all right. Just give me ten slides on 
who you are and what this idea is and what the opportunity is. And that's like, that's sort of like a sales deck almost for your business. So, yeah, the IM has full analysis of, say, market segments, audience, projections of how you'll grow, sales revenue, all of that sort of stuff that you wouldn't really be able to put into a pitch without it being very boring. Um, and for your assignment, it can be a Word document or it could be a series of slides, um, PowerPoint, a keynote if you want. I don't mind what really what the format is, as long as I can open it and read it. In terms of the structure, they vary pretty dramatically, and this, dep this changes depending on the kind of business you're trying to build. This is a, a structure that you can start with. I'm happy for you to deviate from it if you want, if you feel like you know, it's, it's, it's cramping your style. Um, but there are a couple of things I would request that you do include. One of the things is the executive summary as sort of like a standard, and I'll show you an example of that. There's sort of like a two to three hundred word kind of really snappy summary of, of your business. Generally something you could just send in an email would be ideal for that and just have that at the start. Um, if you've got say a marketplace business, uh, business idea, then these sections may look slightly different to say a media startup. So I use this for a media startup idea um, and, it, and it worked relatively well. So that's why I'm recommending it to you. Um, but you may find in your research that there are other, other structures that work well. Cool, so I'll step through those different areas now. Um, as I said, the executive summary, two to 400 words, summary of the whole document, needs to be brief and succinct and tell the best parts, the most enticing parts. Um, there's a couple of, sorry, I'll just before I go into that, this structure thing. So there's divergent views on this and one of the resources I'll share with you is a, um, which I believe is still on Moodle actually, uh, is already on Moodle, pardon me, um, is this document called Pitching Hacks by a company called Venture Hacks. They started a, a marketplace called Angel List, basically study startups. And they have like a recommendation of how to pitch startups in there. It's a really good resource, but they recommend a slightly different structure in there than this. And their whole, their whole frame is like, you should just be leading with traction. You should always be leading with any traction you got is way more effective than say the team or the problem solution or the technology or the market or whatever it is. Traction is like number one. When I've raised money, generally uh, we were raising from a position where we didn't have much traction. So I've, I felt it was better to go with, start with structures like this. And generally that's going to be true for you guys as well. If, and I'll get into this um, uh, next week on some of the details of like raising money and all that sort of stuff, which is a bit more academic for you guys at this point, but it's still interesting. If you get to say series A, series B, where you're raising like $10 million, then traction is everything. Whereas when you're raising a, a seat, what's called a seed round, where it's just basically still an idea and maybe an MVP, then really they're investing in you and your capacity to bring this thing to life. And so that's why, in my opinion, the team and that kind of structure is, is important or, or talking about it and getting them excited so just as a point there. So in terms of the team section, this is generally an outline of each person in the team, uh, why they can execute the plan and their background. For you guys, it's basically just you, for all of you. But if you've got other people affiliated, just put them in. I'll show you an example of ours. Um, the problem and then problem into solutions. So state the problem in as simple as way as possible and then if you need to contextualize it with technical information, don't go over the top, that, that really isn't the place to do it. And then how your startup solves that problem. So raising the specter of, you know, this is a big problem and how do you, how, what's the solution that you have for that? Um, you can use the value proposition that you've, that you've built to actually execute a lot of these things. And if it hasn't changed very much, then you should already have a lot of that content either in your head or, or done from assignment one. You probably just need to expand it out with more of the information that you've got after running your MVP for a couple more weeks, you'll actually have a bit more data and make it more informed. Um, you can incorporate competition there, I've done that before, to demonstrate either they're missing something or the fact that uh, that market segment is mature and you can go after it with a slightly different proposition. 
<coughs> then go into your traction. So you say, look, there's this problem, here's our solution, and here are these people, or here are these companies, or here are these customers, or here are these audience members solving that problem with our product. So the problem might be a lack of you know, great travel content uh, that's targeted at this specific audience, and then our traction is audience data X, Y, Z, and our audience growth numbers saying, hey, we're engaging with this audience. Can't you see that we're solving that problem really well? Um, if you say, all right, off into the future, that, that goal might be X, Y, Z. You need to show the steps and the progress you're making towards that goal in the traction area. So if you say, all right, the market is X, Y, Z large in your problem solution, and we're going to capture this percentage of it, or how far along that journey are you, and how long is it going to get there? How, how long is it going to take you to get there? Um, yeah, in yeah, the hierarchy of traction is really important, is and it is like the news hierarchy. So you guys know the news hierarchy, right? From like hard news reporting, all that sort of stuff. It's basically something has happened. Someone said something's going to happen. Someone said someone said something's going to happen. Someone's opinion gossip. <laughs> and generally, you saying this is going to happen is the equivalent in news of gossip or comment. It doesn't really mean much. But if you go in in the traction section and say, you know, someone has paid me money for this is like the best currency you can get, particularly if you can get a quote or a, you know, a customer endorsement out of them, which we try to do all the time when we're raising money. So try and get other people to talk on your behalf and say how awesome you are, how good this product is, how amazing your business model is, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you imagine that hierarchy down, you can say, well, someone's paying for something, say in the example of a subscription model, you might have one person paying you as a subscriber, but then you've got down the funnel, you might say, well, next step down, we've got 200 people who've signed up for our newsletter and we know that, it, that based on our, our initial data, it's gonna take two to three months for them to convert into a subscriber. So there's like a hierarchy you can kind of play out in terms of traction. It'll be different for all of your ideas, but that gives you a sense of what it should be like. Um, after all that stuff comes, all right, I've built a great product or I've built a great website as in terms of traction, I've recruited a great team, I've got a great office, all that stuff. Um, technology is quite important if you, if you do have any proprietary technology. Uh, the example I'll show you, we had a proprietary kind of platform that we built and it formed quite a core part of our value proposition. We were saying, well, we're actually a technology company as well as a media company when we were raising money. Um, so if you do have anything that's technology-based that solves the problem, then outline it here. The caveat to that being, unlike the others, is if that requires money for you to do, then it's still a good idea to mention it because if you're going to an investor for money, you say, we will use that money to build an asset for you. That's very different to saying, we will build that, you know, take your money to pay ourselves large, large salaries. So it's still value creating in that instance. After that stuff comes all the detail. So the market is the scope of the market, how and where you'll play in that market and what your current and future targets are. Um, some investors say it's really important, or well, some investors, some people who talk to investors a lot say it's really important to talk about how that, that market is growing Whereas other investors say, it's really important that you talk about how big that market is. And generally, the difference is how sophisticated they are as an investor. So uh, in tech investing, they always say you should be trying to win a very large portion of a small market that is going to grow. Um, whereas the, uh, the other opposite angle to that is like, you should be attacking a large market but with a different view on it. But, you know, who knows? You can take either way. Yep. I was thinking about my project or even the your project, Cat project. Mm. How do you measure that type of market? Uh, audience size, yeah. or potential audience size. Yeah. So you're in the food category, right? Yeah. Um, so the question was, yeah, how do you measure the market size? Uh, there's a couple of different ways. The two companies, well, there's three companies now, but the two companies in Australia that define like uh, audience scope and size for the media markets is Roy Morgan Research and Nielsen. Roy Morgan being an Australian company and Nielsen being an international company. And they have a lot of data 
and all, and much of it. And I think I've mentioned it before, actually. A, a lot of it is you can just access to, to get access to you know how big are these categories in digital in terms of traffic size. So uh, average monthly index for specific uh, or topic categories in in the web, and then it'll go deep and tell you, you know, right, what kind of you know, what kind of audience for these sites there is. Um, you can get sort of secondhand data and, and use proximity, which we've done in the past in these kinds of contexts. So we used Facebook uh, community size as a proxy for, all right, how big is this audience? How well developed is this audience? In the context of, say, an Australian market, how big are my competitors' Facebook communities, for example? So that could be a way. What's exactly the name Nielsen and the uh, Roy Morgan Research, but Neil, to be honest, Nielsen is is better and more freely available than um, hey, than more freely available than Roy Morgan. Um, the reason why I mention those is because the media agencies who are tasked with purchasing ad space on behalf of brands use those sources as currency, if you will. They say, all right, am I going to buy ads on this website? Because, and then they use Nielsen to profile the websites and say, and I'll show you some examples in a second. Um, you know, these ones are good for X, Y, Z reason, and then they'll go and buy ads on them. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Um, if you can credibly make the argument of why that market is going to be large uh, in the future, then that's really good, because you can say, look, I'm going to capture a really large segment of this audience, and it's going to grow over time, giving me a sort of a and a natural kind of growth trajectory that won't require that's sort of viral driven, like um what uh, Eric Rees talks about. If you're going after a large market and you're saying, say you're a sports news publisher, and you're going after a large market and the market isn't growing, and you don't really have a very large di distinction on you know that market and a view in terms of your content content strategy that will give you viral growth, then an investor in is and I'll do this to your report as well will immediately just say, well, that means you're going to have to buy your way to success. And, you know, how much is that going to cost? That makes sense? So, for example, like launching a news website on cryptocurrencies is kind of... It would be amazing if you could get investment for that, but that kind of makes sense because cryptocurrencies are, is a small but growing area of interest in the tech scene. So, could you create a news site out around that? As opposed to, or a specific sub niche within, you know, within the food category, or within, say, lifestyle pet related content, whatever it is. But that's not a prerequisite. Having or not having that does not mean you are going to win or or, or lose, right? Like there's plenty of success stories that haven't created a category; they've just had a different view on a category. Like Airbnb had a different view on. Short stay, rent, short stay rentals, right? They didn't create, they didn't create a different segment. It wasn't like there was suddenly more people going on holiday. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the competitive context. So, who are your competitors? How are they structured, and how you, how do you compete against them? Is really important. Uh, what's your marketing strategy? So, how are you actually going to? get your product or your content in front of people. This is quite, this is related to but slightly different to your channel strategy. Um, then sales, so if you, this is, if you're, if you've got advertising in your business model, then I need to be able to see, all right, what's the approach and me method of selling advertising on your website or on your, on your product. Um, and if you've had any traction or if you've tried to do anything or even if you've created emails to send to potential advertisers, I'll be, I'll be really impressed. Because <laughs> this is the area where most students who do this subject really love making content and, they really, and it's really hard for them to take the leap between content and trying to sell the attention that that content creates. So if you can at least try and make that jump, I'll be very impressed. Because as, as I've said before, it's the difference generally between winning and losing. Um, the go-to-market strategy. So what is your holistic go-to-market strategy? Will you compete for one segment only or start with that and attack other segments? Um, will you have one channel or route to market that will be your focus? Will there be other channels? You need to sort of outline your choice. And any funnel work you've done from the previous lecture, put that in there. 
<coughs> so saying, this is my assessment of what my funnel looks like for my different customer segments. These are the different levels of that funnel and here's the process of, of trying to put people through that funnel, whether it's an audience member or you know, an advertiser or a subscriber or someone else. Your channel summary, so that's how you take your product to market. Generally the same as your business model canvas. <coughs> Pardon me. I also have to apologize, I've got a, a banging headache. So if I'm a little distracted. All right, I'll jump into some examples now. But before I do, do you want me to go over any of those or would you like me to go into detail on any of those in a bit more? It might become more relevant once you see some examples, but I'm happy to sort of answer any questions. Cool. All right. So what should I start with? So I'll, I'll show you the actual investment decks that we used or that I've used with, with colleagues over the years and I'll give you a sense of how much money we were raising at the time and whether we, we were successful or not. So the first one, yeah this one, This is getting pretty old now, so. Uh, when we presented this, so this is to someone who eventually came on, became one of our investors, um, Alan Kohler. <coughs> when we were pitching this, we were raising, we were looking to raise between, I think it was between 600 and a million dollars in our seed round, of which we raised, in the end, we raised 650,000. So using this, using this as the starting point and a range of other meetings, and took it took about six months. Um, that's all the legal stuff that I was talking about. So this was our this was our structure, the structure that we went through. Um, for these guys, so how does this vary? Yeah, so we expand, exploded out a couple of different things. So I'll go through this, and you can take from it what you will. I'll put it up on Moodle and I'll put it in Slack so you can kind of see. If there's elements that you would like to emulate, then I'm happy for you to do that in your report. If there's elements that you think are irrelevant, then I'm happy for you to ignore them. So I don't take this as like, you must do every single part of this. This is just like, here are some examples. Take some inspiration. Um, <clears throat> we told them how much money we were raising and what the process was. Uh, Oh, 500 to a million, sorry. Uh, this is our overview. So we went, all right, what's the... This is sort of a version of our executive summary, but although we had an executive summary that was just text, which I'll bring up in a second. And so we, in the in the summary, we were basically like, this is who we are, this is, which, this is our value proposition, this is how we make money, and this is the traction that we've gotten. And we led, the top one that we led with was we've sold some advertising. Uh, so the question was, can we lie? No, no. <laughs> no like, because it's all like a hypothetical, like it's sort of half a hypothetical, half Yeah, so I understand the question, so it's like, because it's ha sort of hypothetical. <laughs> Pardon me, sorry. Um, so, uh, the short answer is no, you can't lie. The long answer is, and I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, right, or last week maybe. So... My general attitude is like, you're not allowed to lie about what's happened in the past. So you're not allowed to lie and say, I've got this advertiser or this advertiser paid me or um, this was, these were our audience numbers. But what you can do is talk about uh, your projection into the future of what's going to happen with your organization or with your startup, right? Yeah. So, and your integrity is on the line, right? Like, so you don't want to lie 
And, and so if you say stuff in your IM that's like totally whack and wild and I just like, oh, that's never going to happen, then like obviously I'll mark you down for that. Because in reality, that's what would happen with an investor if they were reading. They'd be like, this person on drugs is fucking insane, right? Um, <laughs> whereas what you can do is you can project into the market and say, this is, what, this is how we're going to grow potentially. And, and then you can come up behind that and say, we are going to grow into this market because A, we've seen it done before or the market is this big. Or we've done a little test and we know that we can acquire users for this. So therefore, if you give us your money, then we'll be able to acquire those users at that rate over time. Um, so you can talk to it in the context of, particularly like when you're talking to investors, like we're about to close a $3 million round in my other startup. When you're talking to investors, they're not giving you money to go into your bank account, right? So this exercise is to put you in that frame. So you can talk to them about, all right, you, you know, give me... And I wouldn't expect you guys to know like the quantum of the capital that you'll need, maybe a million dollars, whatever it is. But you should have a general idea of what your costs are going to be. But they're not gonna, no one's going to give you money just to pay yourself. They're going to give you money so you can grow the business. But that gives you a, a strength because it means that you can t talk to those kinds of things. You can be a bit ballsy and say, well, if, you, if I get a million dollars, then I could put that into a Facebook advertising campaign that would acquire this many users. And that would then build an audience that's this big, and I know I can sell that audience for this amount of money, Mr. Mr. or Mrs. Investor. So that's where I would do your truth bending. And I know this is a this is a weird this is a good top conversation to have because in the context of a journalism degree, right? This is like anathema to journalism, like journalism is just about the facts. Whereas business is often about confidence. And when I say confidence, I don't mean like just, you know, bolshy people with like, you know, just beating their chest. It's like, um, are you or is that organization able to achieve what it said it's going to be able to achieve? And oftentimes that's still a media company, right? Um, so that's where it lies. Yeah, that, that kind of grey. You say, look, I don't know this is going to happen. I'm a qualified person who, you know, is committed to this vision of this startup. Here's what I'm going to do about it. Generally, if you do that well enough, people will invest in you. Because we didn't have, we had hardly any traction when we raised this amount of money. Yeah. So, it's possible. Um, so we went through the vision, primarily for that point. So we, we sort of articulated what we wanted to grow into. Um, and it was a mix of the fact that we had a proprietary publishing platform uh, and we had a view on cons uh, user-generated content being the new way of doing media. I would have been able to give you this in like a spiel in the startup, uh, sorry, when we were doing the pitch, but this is so long ago now that I've moved on and like my other startup now has, we have our own little spiel and pitch. Ideally, this is too long, I think, like after having gone through a couple more rounds of, of fundraising, I think if you could do it in like one sentence, then do it in a sentence. If you can't, then maybe just think about it a bit harder. Um, and then we say, right, well, that's where we want to go. What's our current expression? And that was at the time Fans Unite. I've shown you guys these, these slides before, so I won't go through it again. But this is a summary of, you know, what the website was and why it was, why it was different. Uh, and then we talked about, yeah, that's just all the, that's similar detail, similar stuff. And we're saying, right, what are we going to do with it? So at the time when we were pitching, we were saying, right, we were going to run, and that was actually part of the startup, the, the investive pitch. We were saying, we're going to launch in sport and then we're going to go into other content verticals. So we're going to go into real estate and politics. And then we were going to take the sport vertical overseas and do investment in finance and do a bunch of other stuff. And we said, right, well, how, is this how does this relate to global trends and precedents? Um, if you just look at the right-hand side column, we said, right, well, there are media companies out there that are doing this. Um, and actually, this was prescient. Like, if we had enough capital, like, that top, like, Vox Media at the time was just doing, just doing this. They're worth, like, $1.5 billion now. And that wasn't a long time ago. Um, and they had a similar model. 
they had a proprietary technology they still do called Chorus. Um, they had a similar content strategy. Uh, yeah. And then we looked at other competitors. So Turner Cable Network acquired a, a platform called Bleacher Report, which was had a similar content strategy and said, well, content strategy behind this is similar. Um, this is how big they are. This is the kind of audience they can garner. And then other platforms in the space, Huffington Post is another user-generated content platform example. Um, and Seeking Alpha is a finance one. So what was our value proposition? So we this we could have taken this directly out of our business model canvas, which we did fill out sort of at the start. Um, and we had three key uh, segments we needed to create value for. Our users, our audience, so people who wanted to consume the content. The creators of content. So some of you guys have user-generated content strategies in your, um, in your startups. So you'll need to articulate it like this because the user the value proposition is slightly different for the people who are creating your content even if they're not getting paid or if they're from your audience it's not just the audience the reasons why they do it are different um, so you have to be able to create value for them uh, and then we got quotes from these guys like Jacinta uh, she was a she was a page editor she created user generated content for us um, uh, she resigned from being a police officer, started writing sports content, and now she's a sports journalist, I believe, up in, up in Queensland. Um, so that was great. And yeah, so we just got a quote from her, and then the, on the brand side, all right, what is it that they want to get out of our platform in terms of advertising? Channel strategy. So what was our channel strategy? Cool. So we had a responsive design site, so we didn't actually have a mobile app. If I was to do this again, I probably would, have make, would make a mobile app. Um, we said mobile as a distribution point um, with and the content strategy around that a desktop and tablet and then our social content strategy how we were going to take our content to those audience segments that and me and then we broke it down and said well there's an occasion strategy across our specific content vertical we say we should we should create content that delivers for a specific need at a specific time during a week I was like the general strategy around our content. Um, and then we went into detail on that. So I got this, this is the kind of data where you articulate like market size. So in the Australian market, it's actually pretty small relative to other media markets, but there was 3.6 million people in that sports vertical audience that we were targeting. Um, and that came from Nielsen, just down the bottom there. Oh, hang on. No, that was a mix of Nielsen and Roy Morgan research data. And there are, if you, if you need it for other markets, Nielsen is global, but then there are other examples out there. Cool. And then sales strategy and pricing. So what were we doing? I showed you this slide um, when we, last week when we were talking about advertising. This was the summary of our sales strategy and how we were pricing it. So we needed to talk to these points specifically around who we were going to target as advertisers, as advertisers. So we said, all right, alcohol, betting, gambling, automotive, finance, FMCG, because we knew that they already advertised in the category. And then how we were going to price it, going back to that advertising strategy I was talking about, sponsorships, uh, you know, what kind of CPM rate we were targeting, etc. And then had we already sold some of those deals and we'd sold one to a beer company, I might just get out of that. I'll give you a quick run through. This was the team at the time. We had a then we went through structure. And then one thing I'll show you before I go somewhere else here. So that's an, an example of a way that I was trying to articulate um, the market opportunity and the competitive context. So the market opportunity on the left, that's pretty standard, you know, easily available data from the Interac Interactive Advertising Bureau around how much people are spending on advertising online. 
that was our that was the market we were competing in as a as a as a business that was raising money from advertising. And on the right, I basically found a range of different audience data for sports sites in this country from Nielsen. Um, and there's a range of other data out there that you can find. Um, I'm just saying, all right, this is what we were competing against. Uh, the rub being, so in the context of that category, that um, chart on the right hand side, there's unique audience on the right hand, on the um, horizontal axis, and then uh, page views per person per month, I believe, on the vertical axis. So it's a way of saying, all right, how big is, big is your audience and how engaged are they? And generally the curve is, in sports websites, is the more engaged you are, the more niche you are. So racing information services and football in this market <laughs> is a niche audience, but they're very engaged. All the way down to Telstra, AFL is very, very large, but not as much engagement. So we were saying, all right, we wanted to create a large audience that had high levels of engagement via a user-generated content strategy. Cool. So I'll share that, and you can go through it if you would like. If you've got any specific questions on it, just hit me up over email or on Slack. So that's a word heavy one, text heavy one. What I might also do, if it's helpful, is share some previous students' assignments again, so you can see. This is an example of what we would send as our executive summary. It's a bit long, so probably too long, over the 400 word limit, but you generally get a sense of what it is, like, and I'll share that as well. Um, you know, who we are, why it's a great idea, what kind of traction we have, our growth. You guys don't need to include that, reasons for capital raising. How do you get to know possible investors? I mean, how, how you knew that you could just talk to yeah, so the question was, how do we know, how do you know, or how do you get to know potential investors? Um, it's hard. I'm not very good at it. Uh, a couple of different ways. Uh, incubators are a good start. So an incubator is, um, uh, they take a portion of your company. You have to apply, you get in, and then you go and work there for three months. And they give you sort of a base amount of money to live on, to prove out your idea. And then they say, all right, we're going to bring in a bunch of investors and you get to pitch on them. And generally, there's like 50% to even potentially higher investment rate after that if you get into a good incubator. Uh, what we actually did was went to a, a broker. There's companies out there that are, and people who are broker investment deals on behalf of bigger companies and, and individual investors. They basically say, look, I'll be the, I'll be the central point for deal, what's called deal flow. And they kind of keep their keep their eyes out for interesting startups that are out there. They might see it in press or whatever like that. So that's why press um, PR and press is kind of good for startups because then it, you know someone who's reading the financial review, who might be one of those people or might be a really wealthy person, then when they get your email, they're like, oh yeah, I've heard of you. Um, so we engaged a person like that who specifically uh, uh, was a specific expert in media deals. In, in Australia and he's so some of the deals like he sold Frankie magazine for example when it sold recently and he sold a couple of businesses to Fairfax um, and a couple of content marketing kind of related deals as well so he and then for that he takes a total he takes a percentage cut of the total amount of money that you raise so we raised uh, in that round 650,000 and he took a percentage of that so which doesn't sound like 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 0.5 percent or 1 percent, but you know, 1 percent of that is 65 thousand dollars, just for making an introduction. So it's pretty lucrative <laughs> uh, for those size deals. These guys like there's lots of them out there. Um, they generally work in deals that are a bit bigger. So some of the deals that he was working are like 50, 100 million dollars, in which case they do a lot more work. 
but if they're working on seed round or startup funds, they're basically just trying to make more connections and eventually, hopefully, some of those become larger companies and then when, then they'll get involved and hopefully get higher fees out of it. Um, another way is, which, which we have done, is literally just to crawl through LinkedIn and just try and get their details. So just, just do research on what are called high net worth individuals, people who generally invest in a space. Um, that's where we raise the majority of our, our money uh, from high net worth as opposed to what's called VC or institutional investors. And I'll talk about those in a second. You can literally just find out who they are generally. Like you can go onto LinkedIn, you can just search through articles and stuff and find out who they are. Then just hunt around for their email address and just email them. But generally that's, you gotta send a lot of emails and you get a lot of no's before you get even someone saying they're willing to talk to you. It's better if it's, the best way is, is if you've got a warm introduction to an investor. And the only real way to get that is if you've worked with them before. So if you work in the media for a while and then you'll meet some more senior people and maybe they go off and do other things. Or um, uh, if you network with them at sort of at industry events, which I'm terrible at because I hate networking. I think it's fucking wank, but <laughs> just a bunch of people sitting around, standing around talking about how awesome they are. However, it obviously works for some people. That's a really uh, that's a really strong way that a lot of deals go into venture capital firms is is by warm introductions, and in that pitching hacks uh, uh, PDF just here, uh, which I will share if it hasn't already been shared, they talk about that a lot, like getting warm warm, warm referrals and introductions, and they actually talk about strategies to do it. Because in Australia, it's all pretty kind of casual, whereas in America, like, this stuff is just intense. There's every single person has started a startup, and the hunt, the the competition for cash is just immense. So there are just these, these machines that are just, you know, hunting to get a referral into Sequoia Capital or all these massive VC firms. That's a very large topic as well, like investing and startup investing and understanding the space but if you're interested in it and you want some advice or if you're looking for introductions then yeah hit me up and I'll, I'll try and help you if I can uh, cool all right now this one so for this uh, this I am that I'll show you is a bit prettier Mainly because I didn't make it. Um, one of our, co our co-founders, who's far better on the uh, on the design tools than me, made it. And for this round of funding, we were raised for this startup. We were raising it's 24 pages. Um, we were raising two million dollars, of which we raised about that. I think it was just under. Um, it. This is like a summary document and then there's a bunch of other stuff that would go with it that this is sort of the crux of the business idea. Disclaimer, as I mentioned before, we have this little video, which I might play you even though it's, it looks stupid. Um, it's us in a disjointed fashion trying to talk about startup. I'll start off by... There we go. So as part of this capital raising, we went to a, an investor event in Hong Kong. That's why I'm wearing a jacket. Uh, and we had this. And you can use it to create publishing websites and different types of websites that are bred for the social world of today. Hello, my name's Justin. Yeah, that was me. And we're all digitally bred, and we're a group of young people passionate about publishing, media and specifically, and challenges for publishing. Well, we've had some really strong success early in channels, strategic channel partnerships and agency channel partnerships. It's a mega close client, so we really have to double down on that early product traction. Whenever you're building digital products, the real risk is basically the pace of change. 
And the way that you overcome that is staying focused and staying in tune with the customers and the users. It's about being aware of how you're in customers are actually using the product and making sure that you're not getting caught in those feedback loops. Our focus at the moment is building on our successful channel partner success that we've had over the past year. We've been going for three years now, so it's been a really big, deep product development cycle. Uh, the team have been really hyped to get through those tough years. So confidence is a SaaS play, and in a SaaS play, what you should really need to look for is a horizontal um, execution, so you've got lots of different custom segments you can go after. Cognitives has that. And the second thing in the SaaS market you need to look for on the SaaS business is uh, smart, scalable routes to market. That comes in the form of a great partner channel and a great strategic um, channel. Leanne Gray and our chairperson have been a champion of that for years. We're a large company um, globally, and we think that's what makes us specifically a very interesting investment. You know, we're really passionate, we're more than uh, engaged in ready for the fight ahead. So I want to talk to you about cognitive surplus. Cognitive, our name, cognitives, comes from... So that's what we would try and open with. A lot's changed and not really... The business is not really like that, so that, that kind of video anymore, sorry. So that video, the purpose that it served was to basically prime investors about who we are, you know, what we were doing, and why they should invest in us. So it wasn't really a marketing thing, it was more like, you know, why should you be interested in talking to us? Um, cool, so we started with, why does Cognitives exist? And this is sort of a mashup of uh, the market opportunity, the problem, and the solution. At the time, we were thinking, all right, our proposition was really based on um, just the disruption of the, the website kind of category, which was, which we've pivoted away from now, uh, around the social web and like social content driving websites. Uh, so we really went on that and we hung on this sort of specific figure, <clears throat> pardon me, which at the time was very effective at raising money. Uh, and, it's, and it was, it was, it still holds true, is that there are <clears throat> over 800,000 websites created every day. So we were like, all right, we want to disrupt that category. That was a very easy thing for when we were in investor meetings or when we were emailing people or when we were sending reports, it was a very easy thing just to talk to. So whatever your like single category or big metric that you want to pull out, that, that was an example of one of ours. I'm quote, I'll skip over that. And then we talked about why, like what's the vision. So the vision of our business was linked to some work that a guy called Clay Shirky had done in the past. He's a media thinker, very interesting, he's written some really good books if you haven't read them, um, around collaborative creation for media products and how the media and other categories are being disrupted by uh, collaborative or co-design. Um, so he was probably the first or one of the first people to acknowledge that in the 90s. And he's basically just been writing that ever since. Uh, in the 90s, yeah, or early 2000s, sorry. And we say, all right, where are we going linked to that vision? And we're saying, and we mapped it to revenue goals. So over a five, five to ten, and ten to fifteen year time horizon, how much like how much money are we going to make? What's the product category we're ca we're going to be um, competing in? Let's skip over that. And then we went into more detail around the problem. The problem for us was basically we articulated it as the competitor stack or the competitors out there were very expensive. Boil it down, that was what we were talking to. I'm saying there's lots of very expensive software products out there. Our product isn't as expensive. And it does a range of different things that media companies need these days around these different types of features, content creation, distribution of content, analytics, websites, social content, distribution of social content, etc. So many quotes. And then that was the solution, an elegant software platform that creates new media companies and websites. I might skip over that bit because it doesn't really make sense. How are we different from our competitors? So solving a problem. And then we said, all right, the old way to solve this problem is with a tech stack. And the tech stack is generally expensive, time consuming to put together. Time consuming and expensive to put together. 
and requires a higher degree of technical skill. And so our, our perspective was that we should take away that technical skill and consolidate that into a unified platform. What was the competition? So how do we define our competition? We defined it like this. And then we talked about traction. So these were, and then we could talk to not only traction, but we could talk to real hard revenue numbers, which obviously is, is harder to do for you guys. But then we could say, look, we'd made over half a million dollars in revenue in that, that year uh, from our different customers. <coughs> and specifically around our channel partners, we had um, some traction with some bigger channel partners at the time. Don't worry about it. if you don't know what channel partners means, it doesn't really matter in this context. And then we went into detail around some of them. At the time we had a partnership with say AAP, so we talked to them a little talked about that a little bit more. In subsequent documents we had more quotes from these guys as opposed to just talking about them. The best the best thing that you could have there is brands that someone's that people have heard of. So for example, if you're in the you know pet category. If you could talk to well-known pet brands as potentially as potential partners or people that you're doing partnerships with or advertisers, something like that, that's probably for in the context of any startup, it holds a lot of traction more more than they're worth in terms of money that they spend in advertising. If a big brand is willing to put their their name to what you're doing, because it carries a lot of risk. So if you can pull that off, generally it means that you're doing something unique, novel, or that you're really good at selling, and any of those, is, if any of those are true, then you're probably worth investing in. Cool. The total market, we were targeting businesses, so we defined the total market in, in terms of the number of businesses that we were targeting, of which there was a large number out in the world, so we went with the whole, this is a large total addressable market, and we're going to capture a small amount of it, and you're going to be very rich. <laughs> and then our channels, our route to market and channel strategy was outlined here. All this is a bit different because it's software based as opposed to media. None of you guys, I don't think anybody is doing a software startup, so you can ignore that. And then there's um, all the financial modeling stuff, which you guys don't have to do. But if you do ever are in a point where you need to do something like that, I'll, like all of this stuff, we'll have all of those resources in there, so you can always go back to it. This was our team at the time. Uh, and then we talked about the investment opportunity. Cool. Now there's a couple of others I might show you. This is an example of a... Oh, I won't go through that in detail now. I'll load that up and you can see it. What is really cool is um, this... There's a, a few of these going around, but this one, this is a pretty good collation and it's basically just a range of startup pitch decks out there for well-known startups and what they actually look like. There's a couple of content ones in there that you might find interesting. So YouTube is really interesting. Some of these other ones are not as relevant for a lot of you guys, but what the one I found really interesting was the BuzzFeed one. So what? how were BuzzFeed communicating about themselves when they raised, let's, let's see what it, yeah, $3.5 million in 2008. If you imagine the size of BuzzFeed now and the scale of success, if you think it came out of that, you know, eight years ago, it's pretty amazing. Uh, Jonah Peretti was the main guy who did this. As you can see by, he's got his email up there. I'll, I'll be amazed if that still works. Some of you guys should email him and ask for a job on that email address. Um, so who are they? So they had... 700,000 unique visitors per month. Wow. <laughs> Actually, let's reference that now and see what BuzzFeed is at the moment. Just to see the scale. range of apps 250 million ish Oops. 
So they started with traction. They had a widget. They've got they had two editors doing all of that. That's pretty amazing, actually, just two people. Um, and they had proprietary technology, is what they talked to, uh, on the core technology around virality. And they were spending 60k a month. Uh, and then social social proof quote from CNN around some some press. So that's. If you imagine like what BuzzFeed is in the machine that it is, that's not a lot of traction. You know, that's quite impressive. Um, and then, yeah, they bent the truth. Where are we headed? In their, in their case, it turned out to be true. Uh, a one stop, so, and also the really cool thing about this, if you think about the value proposition of what BuzzFeed is now, this is how they were trying to communicate that to people who'd never heard of BuzzFeed before ever. So one stop shop for web buzz editorial algorithmic and user generated. Uh, to the investor audience, it was a low-cost model, so they reckon they could grow traffic without hiring lots and lots of people, which was the problem with the traditional, which is the problem with the traditional media model. Uh, Self-serve advertising platform, well, they've obviously gone away from that. Uh, and what they wanted to do was hire a general manager, a VP of business development, so salespeople, uh, some devs, and then a community manager. So that must have been a, a screenshot of their early widget. An algorithmic content. That is so cool. User generated content, okay. And then the home page. Pretty old school home page. I guess this is a 2008. I wonder when they introduced the OMG nav. Right, so they were looking to launch video and all of these other different content sections after they raised money. It's a lot of money to raise just to and just to hire a couple of people, 3.5 million. Right. And this must these must have been like snapshots of like we have proprietary technology to work with content. What does that do? So virality or indication of virality. When uh, I was looking to buy advertising from BuzzFeed, they showed me a little bit of what this has obviously become, but on the advertising side, and it's pretty amazing what they can predict. So that's obviously a core component of their strategy is to invest in proprietary technology for media. They were basically saying we could predict you know, seed versus organic reach and social based on how their content performs. There's a really good interview um, on Download This Show with uh, the founder of Optimizely, if you've heard of that. He was a guy who worked on Obama's uh, election campaign and on a lot of different things in there. And then he founded a company called Optimizely, which is just about A-B testing and, and scientifically testing web content. And he talks a lot about how media companies use that specifically BuzzFeed and how they use testing and optimization of headlines and images and content article structure to basically get viral growth and viral results. It's very interesting. That's on the ABC's website. Um, yeah, cool. I wonder how much they were. Uh, I don't actually, because I don't, I don't read BuzzFeed. Do they still have user-generated content as part of it? No? None at all? It's no. interesting. So they obviously hadn't figured it out. So a free open platform for launching Buzz was their revenue model. They definitely still sell content as advertising or uh, native ads. Cool. I'll share this link up so you can go through it in, on your own. Distribution promotion. So these are the similar to what I was showing you from the Fancy Night deck. Like, what does it look like when someone advertises on our site? What's what's an example? Can you mock up something? 
and they've obviously done that. I'm assuming those are actual real advertisers as well. So what does the widget look like? Buzzfeed microsites that we're already doing, oh, that's cool. So that's the brand destination, like a branded destination. And trend targeting, okay, I'm assuming that was an effort for them. <clears throat> this is where innovation on the actual revenue side is really important. That's an attempt for them to basically create more valuable inventory, sort of like search. So if there's a trend and you want to sponsor it, then you can create an ad out of basically the, att the attention you create by curating a set of content somewhere for them being a trend or what's happening. It's a very interesting way of defining their competitive set. Now thinking about BuzzFeed, that's definitely not how I would define their competitive set, but it's interesting. Hmm. That was a team, Kenneth Lear. He's a really well-known um, media investor from New York. Duncan Watts as well. Uh, they don't go into how much they were asking for and what terms. So that's an example. I love looking at stuff like that on this. So you imagine all of these different companies, you know, just the volume, just how big that they are now, and they all started from a similar place. You know, they all built an MVP. They were all trying to figure out their idea. None of them had it nailed as well. This is the great thing about like, I find kind of comfort in looking at these things because these guys didn't know what they were doing. Like, they knew what they were doing, obviously, but they didn't know what the answer was. They were going through the same kind of iterate hypothesis kind of testing mechanism that you guys are going through. Um, and I think the, yeah, these companies collectively have raised over $400 million. And some of them have obviously become incredible successes. And there's a bunch of these out there. You can go and check out different ones, like different startup. So that one's on attach.io startup pitch decks. There's, some, there's another one here. I think it might be even more. Yeah, some similar ones in there, but even more. So you might be able to find a few more media ones like Snapchats in there. Cool. App Nexus. That's a large um, advertising platform, like digital advertising platform. Cool. All right. I might leave it there. Unless you guys have any questions specifically, or do you want me to go through specific sections? Um, I said in my MVP that I needed to, or that I wanted to have organic growth, but what if I want to advertise my, yeah, what, what if I want to advertise to make my community grow, where should I include that? In the strategy, yeah. um, in your marketing strategy and your go-to-market or your channel summary, depending on what structure you go for. So if I go back to the recommended structure, so 
your marketing strategy and you go to market and all your channel summary. So channels you would take your product to market with and you'd probably, you'd probably want distinct, to distinguish, distinguish between um, you doing advertising to uh, increase awareness of a brand versus you doing advertising to try and grow an audience. Um, because if you do a bit of research on this, you'll find there's lots of, lots of people have, have spoken about audience development tactics um, specifically around you know, paying, sponsoring a piece of content into social um, and the tactics around that. Ideally, you'd probably, you wouldn't recommend doing something like that unless you had some initial data to say, we think that you know, we should spend some money on you know, advertising content behind content or to try and grow, the, grow an audience because the return is X. You know, we think we, based on say a test that we've done, even if it's a small test of like five to ten dollars, you can get data out of that that says so many people clicked on this piece of sponsored content when I spent ten dollars sponsoring, you know, pushing it through Facebook, for example. And we did that for Fancy Night. Um, we ran a range of tests. Uh, in the media context, I think I brought them up. Yeah, this investment. Yeah, yeah, so it totally. Have to be anything like some, I don't know, I think I'm freaking myself out here thinking like how much it needs to actually be out there. Yeah, so the, so the general question is how big does it have to be? Yeah. And uh, so it doesn't have to be big uh, is, this, is the standard response. It, sh it can and probably should be small. Like you're not supposed to be the next like age or BuzzFeed right now, right? Yeah. But... That's really good, actually. That's a really good question. So that BuzzFeed pitch deck obviously highlights shit that they didn't know about their model, right? And there's a bunch of stuff you don't know, so you want to do some tests to try and figure it out. So the best, like the absolute best rolled gold stuff that would go into that is like the reason why we did this for our MVP was to test this hypothesis, say, about our go-to-market. We thought or we think that... <clears throat> the way we're going to grow our audience is via paid distribution of content. And we did a test where we spent, you know, we created an article and it had this much organic kind of traction through social. So you put, put it on your Facebook page and it was shared. So it obviously had a little bit of traction. And then you said, right, well, I want to test. If I amplify that with some money, will it have, will it get the same result? So will there be an, a positive ROI if I spend some money behind that, for example? And then do that, you know, small amount of money if you want. You don't have to do this, um, but just to, to give you a sort of context, if I could see that, then that would be amazing. Like that would be really good because it would directly go to the heart. It would be a test directly at the heart of one of your assumptions around how you're going to grow your audience. Um, on the flip side, what would be bad is if you just talked about that, but then I didn't see you actually doing it. As opposed to like saying, oh, we're going to grow a massive audience, but, you know, how? <laughs> so, for example, in those, in those pitch decks, we talked about <clears throat> audience acquisition and we'd specifically done some tests in Facebook just doing that, not spending a lot of money. We spent, over the course of a couple of months, we probably spent about $1,000, so nothing really in comparison to the amount of money we were, we were raising. Um, obviously, a lot of money you know, to anybody, but <clears throat> we basically said these are the results. When people, when we put money behind content, on average, people click on it at this rate, and it costs us like five cents per click to get people to come to the website. When they do that, a certain percentage of them stick around for a while. They might read another piece of content. It's really valuable information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then that many customers went to our website. Yeah. From there. So you could say, and like in the context of it being a viral kind of yeah. acquisition yeah. of users, yeah. 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 So you could say like over this, so we had 200 followers 
and we know based on our audience analytics from Google Analytics that say two percent of them or one percent of them have, can, have come back to our have come to our website and consume content um, every month, which equates to like twenty people. But at scale, that's fine, right? Like if, if that's your acquisition channel, so it might be you'd say organic production of, of viral and quality organic uh, content that will drive organic acquisition of an audience through those channels. So rather than, because really it's all money, right? Like you guys don't pay yourselves at the moment, but if you were thinking about this like a business owner, you'd probably have to pay someone to manage those social channels to acquire the audience anyway, and there would be a dollar figure attached to that. And this is, and you just basically say, well, I know that you know I have to employ Mary, Jane, and Oliver to manage the Instagram account and so many of those people will come back and become an audience member over time as opposed to taking that amount of money and say spending it on advertising and how what percentage of those people will convert back and then it's just a like an economic decision right or maybe it's an audience thing maybe maybe you have to do that because your audience expects it or it's in the nature of the way that your category works or some sort of insight around the kind of content you're creating that someone like me probably doesn't have or an investor Sorry, that became a pretty rambling answer. Uh, so even if it wasn't, so in our initial pitch of our website or our blog, so it's now from there, then how are we going to get more people to come and hit and have views on the blog or have views on the site? And then how we show that in our pitch, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And all of that is articulated in what your go-to-market strategy is. So say, because this mightn't be true for everyone, but say for your one, if if you think, all right, I think my content strategy is, is good and the value proposition is right, but I'm not too sure how I'm going to grow an audience. And if you, these are this, like those hypotheses of things that would probably be going through your mind in the form of anxiety around how am I going to create like an, a massive audience. If you just wrote those down as as a sump, like, assumptions or things to try not assumptions but strategies things to try out then just try and you've probably got an idea of what are the best ones best top three just try and test them and that'd be a great that'd be a great use of your time if you're a startup founder like if you were really racing the clock in terms of like your bank balance to try and figure it out before like you had to shut the whole thing down then that would be the best use of your time I might cut it there. I've got a cranking headache. <laughs> Sorry. But um, I'll hang around and answer any questions. I, I will send out all of the marks midweek. So you should have all the marks back, but generally everybody did pretty well, which was positive. Um, and then if you've got any questions about, about this next assignment or the feedback on your assignment, over the break, just um, give me a call or send me an email. Cool.